I'm all fired up about cute classrooms because there are a few things that I just want to get off my chest and you know that that's I'm just keeping it real right all right so I'm going to go through a few points that I have about cute classrooms and I'm sorry that the screen is so close but I have to hold this in my hand because my screen got locked on accident all right so um, I'm going to go through a few points so bear with me for a few minutes. We're going to get started on this hot, hot topic of cute classrooms. And you can chime in with your thoughts, your ideas, your observations, and whatever. And then we, I'll go through the comments and discuss some of those with you. And I also have resources to share with you. So has anybody noticed, anybody out there that has kids in the classroom right now, or is a teacher, anybody in education who was a teacher, have you noticed the rise over the last few years in classroom decor, like actually in the classrooms, like more decoration than you've ever seen before. Let me know in the comments if you have noticed this trend, and if you haven't, that's okay. Um, maybe it's just those of us who um, are seeing it more online. But I think part there's there's several reasons for this. Some people say, oh, it's Pinterest. Well, you know. It has something to do with it, but I think it's like a perfect, this is my opinion, of course, these are all my opinions. I believe that this is a perfect storm that we've had happen here in the U.S., maybe it's happening in other places too, of things that have collided all at once to create these classrooms that are so visually overstimulating that it's, it's almost jaw-dropping, okay? It's so much that I can't even believe it when I see it. Um, so some of it might be Pinterest. We're seeing, we are getting a glimpse into, thank you, Amy, I'm glad. We're getting a glimpse into other teachers' classrooms through Pinterest that we have never experienced before. The internet has always been there, but it was only, you know, those people who somehow found a way to get their pictures out there and seen. But now Pinterest has really, really lit the fire under how uh, the, peer the peer pressure really this is what I think. We're seeing these other classrooms, we're comparing ourselves as teachers and we're trying to you know keep up with the teacher next door, right? And that teacher being on Pinterest. So I think Pinterest is part of it. <laughs> I'm glad that other people have noticed it too. Um, so Pinterest is only part of what I see as the problem. So Pinterest allows us to get a glimpse into classrooms from around the world. It's very easy to use. It's a visual filing cabinet, right? I love Pinterest. Pinterest is great. Pinterest is not the the, the whole part of this problem. Uh, the second part of the problem is peer pressure. We're keeping up with the teacher next door. We're, we're competing with each other, okay? And that's always been a problem in education because we as teachers are very, very isolated and that creates a culture of competition so we have Pinterest as part of the problem we have peer pressure we see the teacher next door decorating to the nth degree and we want to keep up with the Joneses or the teacher next door so um, those are two parts of the problem there's more okay I told you this was a perfect storm all of these things are happening at the same time to create this perfect storm of overstimulating over decorated classrooms okay yes there has been and I know uh, this isn't news to any of you out there there has been a steep decline in respect for teachers now teachers have never gotten a lot of respect right but here in America right now we are getting the least amount of respect that we've ever had in all my years in education so the media is playing a role in this, okay? So we have a decrease in respect for teachers, okay? So, so far we've got Pinterest, we've got peer pressure, we've got a decrease in, res in respect, but we also have a rise in standards and expectations. So respect is down, standards and expectations are up. Let me know in the comments or with the thumbs up if you agree with that so far. I'm not done. I still have more. I told you it's a perfect storm. All of these things are coming together. Now, let's, yes, we've always had a lack of respect, but education in general has steeply and sharply declined 
due to all the negative media coverage that we've been receiving in the last few years steeply declined so it was bad before and now it's absolutely abysmal thank you I can see all the little thumbs up here's the last one so that's actually five things Pinterest peer pressure decline in respect I know it's hard to imagine we could get any any less respect than we already have rise in standards and expectations and the fifth one is the biggest one decreased morale we are less satisfied with our jobs because it's become a worse job. We have increased expectations, increased standards. We have this decline in respect. And at the same time, it's brought our morale down. So what do we do to make ourselves feel better? We create what we feel are beautiful classrooms, right? All of this stuff is happening at the same time to create this problem. Sherry says, I used to have a cute classroom, but I'm a rebel. <laughs> when things get trendy, I tend to go in the opposite direction. I totally agree. All right, so we are talking about cute classrooms and the problem. Wendy, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. We are more burned out than ever due to these increased standards and expectations, decreased morale, and that morale is decreased because the pressure is on us more and more. We have that decline in respect that the media plays. Yes, we have to give more and more. That's right, Marsha. We're giving more and more of ourselves. So we're trying to feed our spirit and our soul and trying to enjoy our jobs. We, oh, Veronica, yes. You guys are, are helping me fill in those words I didn't have. We make it pretty to hide the sadness. And because there's a lot of us in this field that are female, that's just a fact. I'm not saying anything that's not true. Um, oh, and Sheila, that's another good one. I'm going to get to that in a minute. You've got ahead of me. That's absolutely true. And the pay is low. That's right. That comes to the decreased morale and the decreased res uh decrease in respect as well. Teacher evaluations play into that whole thing too, Patty. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have a rise in this over-decorating trend that we are seeing due to these five points I just covered. Can't even get my hand in there. If you are just joining us and you want to go over those five points again, you can watch this broadcast from the beginning, as soon as I'm done talking tonight, it will be available on replay. Yes, money is a part of it too. All right, so she, um, Sheila already started this one, so I'm going to go there now. Parents, a lot of times, now this is not intentional. Parents are, are not always educators, right? But they expect a cute classroom because everyone else is, ha is having an over decorated cute classroom so they think that's the norm okay so then they start to compare the teachers and they start to think that if your classroom isn't cute you must not be a good teacher okay what do you think about that do you agree let me know with your thumbs up if you agree with that it's, I love that I can see all the thumbs up now I believe yes just say no to over decorating I believe that parents are comparing teachers based on how the classroom looks. It's not because parents are mean or evil. We love parents. We wouldn't have jobs without parents. But they just don't know any different. They are not educators, okay? So, also, another part of the problem is that, and I'm going to get to the solutions too. I'm not just going to talk about the problem. I can't stand when people do that. They just talk about the problem. I just want to define the problem before we start to solve it, okay? Because I do have some ideas for solving it. But sometimes principals and administrators judge teachers based on the attractiveness of the classroom. And that just is not acceptable. It totally doesn't matter what your classroom looks like. Uh, you can still be an effective teacher. I'm not saying it should be a, a, you know, a dumping ground or anything like that. It needs to be you know, organized, of course. <laughs> um, but it doesn't have to have pom-poms hanging from the ceiling. It doesn't have to have 18 feet of chevron border in five different neon colors. It doesn't have to have a rug with 18 different colors on it. It doesn't have to have a matching rug with a matching chair and a matching pillow all from Hobby Lobby, okay? <laughs> oh, Diane, 
don't get me started on the data walls. Don't get me started on the focus walls. I have a whole thing about that. That is one of my pet peeves. That's one of the things that gets me fired up. That's one of the things that has been pushed down, down, down to pre-K and K. So inappropriate. Okay. Yes, Leslie, welcome, welcome. Parents see cuter classroom as the better teacher. So what do we do about that? I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So first I'm defining the problem, then we're going to look at some solutions. The third thing, and I've heard this from a lot of teachers, so I'm going to go there. In Texas, we call this pobrecito syndrome, okay? If you're not from Texas, pobrecito means poor little thing. You poor little thing. It's when teachers take pity on their kids. So for example, I've always worked in at-risk schools with Title I populations. That means that those children come from low-income homes. They often have unstable home lives. Not always, but often, okay? So we as teachers in the inner city and in, in uh, Title I schools and in at-risk situations and places like Head Start, sometimes we take pity on the kids, okay? And we try to make our classroom the most inviting, safe, happy place we can think of. And we're doing it out of the goodness, oops, sorry, we're doing it out of the goodness of our heart with the best of intentions, okay? But the problem with that is, and it's a big problem, is that if a child doesn't have enough to eat at home, if a child doesn't have clothes or clean clothes to wear, what your classroom looks like is the least of their problems, okay? What your classroom looks like isn't going to help them, all right? What they could benefit from most, thank you for the hearts, what they could benefit most is a really deep connection with you and with the kids in your class by creating a school family or a classroom community. That's going to do them so much more than a cute classroom or pom-poms on the ceiling or chevron on the walls, okay? So a cute classroom doesn't do anything to help your children if you're teaching, if you have pobrecito syndrome, okay? If, you if you're taking a pity on your kids because they come from poor homes, poor families at risk, making a cute classroom isn't going to help them, okay? I'm just putting that out there. That's a proven fact. There's lots of research done on the pobrecito syndrome. This was a really big deal here in Texas, excuse me, um, back in the early 2000s. We had trainings on this, okay? So this is a real thing. I've worked with teachers who um, have pobrecito syndrome and um, it doesn't benefit the kids, okay? So a pom-pom's not going to help. Chevron's not going to help. Nurture their hearts. That's right, Marcy. Yay! Thanks, Holly. All right. Forming those relationships will help them socially and emotionally. That is so right, Nicole. That is where they're going to benefit most. Not from the Chevron, not from the pom-poms. Karen, the Teaching Tribe is my membership site. Um, Tom will drop a link for you so you can check it out. All right. Yes, Sherry, sometimes administrators, without meaning to, will compare teachers based on how their classroom looks, and that's not okay. Yay, Marie, I'm so glad you agree. Thank you. I love coming on Facebook Live because I feel like y'all are usually almost always on the same page as I am. Physical and social needs need to be met before learning takes place. Absolutely. Oh, Melina, I can't wait to talk about the data and the focus wall. Seriously. I don't know if I'll be able to contain my, my activity issues. And we're going to come right back. Refresh your browser. All right. I'm going through comments here. <laughs> oh, oh my. Okay, Katie, you just made me laugh out loud. I have to read that. Hierarchy of needs does not include Chevron. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Love it. Oh, oh, goodness. Yes. Teacher comparisons happen a lot, especially when there are siblings in different classrooms. Yes, Annie, absolutely. Oh, Nadine, you don't want to know what a focus wall is. It's the most horrific thing in the whole world. Okay. A good teacher will have the kids make the classroom cute. You guys are amazing. I love it. When there's nothing on the wall, it looks like it's bare. Okay, they, we're, we're ready to move on then. Yes, Crystal, I'm on, a, I'm on a roll tonight. Thank you. All right, I can't go too far back in the comments, so I lose the new ones. All right, hey, aloha. Hey, look, 
Yvette, look, I have I have little lays right here because I'm getting ready to do a Hawaiian themed event for Splash. I knew you were coming. See, all right. So we've we've identified the problems, and if you're just joining us, we're talking about is your classroom cute enough? You can go back and see all of the identification of the problem in the first part of this broadcast. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the research. And yes, there's even research to back this up. So what does the research say? The research says, and the Tom has some links to some great articles that he's going to drop for you in the comments. Articles about this cute classroom in the culture of cute. So, too much visual stimulation can negatively impact learning. That's a fact, okay? There's, re there's people out there researching this, and I'm so glad that they are. It's not my cup of tea. I don't like research so much. I wouldn't want to spend all my day doing it. I like to cite it, though. Ooh, I saw some angry faces. Ooh, I wonder what they're angry about. Data walls. They must be angry about data walls. All right, or data walls, sorry. So too much visual stimulation can negatively impact learning. That's a fact. Kids, think about the kids in your classroom. Kids are already hyped up, right? They don't need any help being hyper, right? They don't need any help doing that. What they need is a calming, soothing environment that's conducive to learning, especially if they come from chaotic homes. If they have at-risk home lives, the best thing you can do for them is to create a calm, caring environment, okay? Um, focus. Kids' attention spans are very, very short. So if we're overstimulating them with chevron and pom-poms and polka dots and just neon colors everywhere, um, how are we helping them focus or hindering them, really? That's what it comes down to, okay? Kids are easily distracted. If we have a lot of stuff everywhere, they're, they're always like squirrel, 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 right? I mean, that's how they are. So add some more stuff in there. Add some more stuff from the ceiling and some more chevron neon borders. And what do you have? You have a recipe for disaster. So they're, they're visually overstimulated kids are by a magnitude of bright colors and designs so what the research has shown is that this is actually visually damaging they said that it's in print visually damaging and I know for me I can't look at Chevron if I have to look at Chevron I actually get dizzy okay and I looked it up one time because I was like I can't even stand it and it's a thing okay so just because it doesn't visually overstimulate you doesn't mean that it won't visually overstimulate others, okay? And kids can't filter out what's important and what's not important. Everything on the wall becomes important to them because they don't have that filter yet. They're little kids. So all this stuff that we're putting up is just, I know, Chevron, it's like zigzags. When I first heard about it too, I was like, what's that? I thought Chevron was a gas station. <laughs> it's zigzags. Do, 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 like that. You know, you see people wearing chevron clothes all the time, but borders. Yes, Amy, there can be a balance. So, <laughs> Liz says she loves chevron for her home, but not her classroom. Okay, I told you I would um, touch on the focus walls and the data walls. And what those are, somebody said, what are those? Well, just thank your lucky stars that you don't have to do them. There's something that's been pushed down from the upper grades into the lower grades, and it basically it's a big wall of, uh, yeah, thanks, Tom, a big wall of data of, uh, it, it doesn't have any meaning to pre-K and kindergarten kids. There is absolutely no point in doing anything like that um, in an early childhood classroom. It serves absolutely no purpose except to take up a lot of space on your wall, create a lot of work for the teacher, and it's just visual clutter and distraction for the kids. So whoever came up with it, I'm sure it was a great idea for high school or maybe middle school, and somehow it got pushed down into these younger grades where it's completely inappropriate. So if you don't have to do one, don't worry because you're very lucky and they are just horrible, horrible practices. It's the same thing like it's it's like pre-writing an anchor chart. And if you don't know what an anchor chart is, thank your lucky stars for that too. But there's this trend in the educational world right now of 
uh, pre-writing your anchor charts. And an anchor chart is not, it, that's a complete misinterpretation of what an anchor chart is. But basically they're little charts you can make um, with the children. It, it, it's all about the process, not the product. And uh, some people pre-write them and put them on the walls as decor um, so that they don't have pre-bought stuff, but we just defeated the whole purpose. So anyway, that's another one of my pet peeves. No pre-written anchor charts. Woo! <laughs> Yes, data walls are for show for visitors. That's right, Annie. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the same person who thinks that pre-K should post the standards when the kids can't read. Yes, and Maria is absolutely right. Children's artwork should dominate the decoration in the classroom. Absolutely. So we talked about the research. We talked about the problem. Here's what you can do instead. So <laughs> the happy part is coming. Um, so instead... <laughs> and this is so much easy, so much easier to say than to actually do. But the children need to have a connection with every single thing that is placed on the wall in the classroom. Okay, because the classroom is their home, their home away from home. You are the facilitator in their learning. This is their space, right? It's the classroom is there for the children. In, in most cases, you are there and you're paid to facilitate the children's learning. You're like the, the person who's in charge of the classroom, but the space is for the kids. So you're not creating a space for yourself. You're creating a space for the people who inhabit the room, okay? So we don't put things up on the walls unless the children have a connection to that and, and they've created helped create it in some way and even if you have something that's pre-bought because I certainly have pre-bought things I introduce it to the children and it's a tool that the kids can use so like I have a daily picture schedule you know and you can certainly make those with the kids but I introduce it to the children and I use it as a tool so anything that you put on the wall is a tool to help kids learn or they have a connection to it and have helped create it. So those are my two things. Um, bulletin boards, uh, I get this one all the time. So what should you do about bulletin boards? Because parents expect to see bulletin boards when they come into your classroom. And so this is great, this is so easy. I actually have a bulletin board behind me here, if you can see it, it has some of my products on it. So um, I just put, and I know about the 20% rule, some of you posted that, that almost killed me when, when it first came out. If you don't know what the 20% rule is, um, many fire marshals or fire, uh, you know, districts fall into areas where the fire marshal has made a, a rule or a law, and they're, they're not making it up, they're following uh, the law to the letter, is that no more than 20% of your walls in your classroom space can be covered. And, and that is okay because um, it's doable. That just means you can't plaster paper from floor to ceiling and you can't have excessive amounts of stuff on the walls. It wasn't created to make our lives, the rule wasn't created to make our lives miserable. <clears throat> I, I know because I had a fire marshal's wife call me one time. <laughs> um, my cat wants to get on screen tonight. Maybe she has some information about data walls. Um, so that's what the 20% rule is, okay? So you can't have more than 20% of your classroom uh, walls covered with stuff. And that comes from the fire marshals. So some of you might have to adhere to that and others won't, okay? Uh, it just depends on where you're located. So I taught at a school that was five miles away from another school. We had the 20% rule and they didn't because they had a different fire marshal. So you just need to check with your fire, mar fire marshal about covering the walls with stuff. And it's all about it, uh, meeting the code so, uh, you know, the fire code so that your school can be insured. And that's all that that's about. It doesn't have anything to do with you personally. Um, but it can make you cry at times when they make you take things down. Um, so bulletin boards at the beginning of the year, um, you can put under construction. My favorite one that I've seen is to put that construction tape, like you get, you can get that at Home Depot and you put it across your bulletin boards and it says under construction. Um, that's really cute. Or coming soon. Like you could put a little movie poster theme and, you know, and put coming soon in the kids artwork or something that the kids have done is going to go there eventually or soon, right? Um, so that's how you can um, battle the bulletin boards at the beginning of the year. But one thing I do is I always put um, black sheets on my bulletin boards because sheets don't fade. And if you stretch them really tight, 
You can keep them up for years and years and years. I don't know about you, but I don't have time to be changing bulletin board paper. And it fades really quickly and it rips and it looks terrible after a few months. And uh -uh, I put black sheets from Walmart up there, staple them, pull them really tight. They look awesome. You never know that they're sheets. Um, they'll, they'll last forever and ever as long as it's okay with your fire marshals. So I was able to use sheets as long as I didn't violate the 20% rule. So I chose that. I put that on all my bulletin boards. That's the background. It's always the same. And I put some simple bulletin board border up. Nothing fancy. And that bulletin board border stayed up all year. Now I know that there's companies out there that sell, you know, cute bulletin board border. Um, and they make a living doing so. Um, and I had plenty of it in my classroom. Um, but now I would, I prefer to just have plain bulletin board border. It's the same. I know this is shocking, right? This is like a revelation. The bulletin board border is the same for every bulletin board in my classroom. <gasps> if you see pictures on my site, Tom will drop a link in the comments to where you can go and see pictures of my website. Um, but the bulletin board border is mostly all the same and the backgrounds of all the bulletin boards are the same. Um, so another thing you can do, cut down on visual clutter, right? So try to avoid these overstimulating um, patterns and hanging things, moving things. Um, use calming colors like light blue. And uh, I have a few books I'll share with you in the, uh, in the comments in just a few minutes um, where some of this research comes from. So very calming colors. So neon, probably no, red, no. Um, there's research that's been done on this. And so if you think about it, um, there's actually been research done on fast food chains. So McDonald's colors are like bright yellow and red, right? And those are two colors that research has proven increase your blood pressure and increase your appetite. So there is a method to their, their plan there. So they are definitely intentionally using colors to stimulate appetite. So is that something we want to stimulate in children? Do we want them to be hungry? Do we want them to be overstimulated? You know, do, would we use those colors in the classroom? So there's research out there that's been done on that. So, cut down on visual clutter. So I'm going over the, the like the solutions. Um, put under construction or coming soon on your bulletin boards. Um, make sure that the children have a prior connection to anything you put up on the wall. Um, build a sense of ownership. And some of you have said this in the comments. And uh, hi, um, some of you have said this in the comments. Um, have the kids help create things. Give them a sense of ownership. But here's my my line for the night. I always have one thing that I come away with that I uh, that I really liked. I want you to think about who lives in that classroom. Does Martha Stewart live there or do kids live there? That's what you want your classroom to say. Do you want your classroom to say Martha Stewart lives here or kids live here, right? So we're not competing with the teacher next door to have the cutest classroom. there It is not a, a race. It's not like Survivor. It's not like The Bachelor. It's nothing like that. Um, we're in it for the same reason, to help the kids. So um, build that sense of ownership. Your classroom should look like kids live in it, not Martha Stewart. Um, if it's on the wall, it should be at eye level. Anything above that is called decoration. So I did have some decoration in my classroom. I had my bulletin boards and I had my border. And, you know, my kids were four, so almost all the bulletin boards were above their heads, right? So that's decoration. And so most of the things that I put up, now they helped build a sense of ownership because they were artwork and things that kids created, right? But they weren't tools that I used for learning. Any tool that I used, like my visual daily schedule or um, any kind of charts or anything like that, that was all at the children's eye level. Because anything above that just becomes decor. Um, and everything you put on the wall, make it meaningful, useful, and use it often. Um, those, are, those are my three tips for that. Anything that you're going to put on the wall, it needs to be useful, has to have a purpose, um, and you have to use it often with the children. So anything that you put up. Those three books, <laughs> okay, I think my comments are coming back, I think. Um, items in the classroom should represent their neighborhood and their home life. That's a very good point, Alice. I agree with that. 
I remember one time um, I was doing environmental print in my classroom and um, I was gathering environmental print from my home and I had a, a box from Pizza Hut and I took the little box to school and I was going to use it for environmental print and none of my kids knew what that print was because the only pizza place in the neighborhood where I taught was CeCe's but they knew the CeCe's logo so then I was like oh yeah so I had to get a CeCe's box <laughs> Kim says she totally agrees that the space is for the kids oh Shannon I'm glad that you're not going to do a focus wall parents don't un come into the classroom a lot yes Shannon there's no need to do a focus wall please don't do one <laughs> Anne says um, that West Virginia did away with Eckers. Yes, they're very they're very prescriptive. Yes, we have to do we will and I will statements. I know, it's crazy. Okay, so I think my comments are frozen up, but that's okay. Um, so there's three books that I was going to share with you. Um, the first one, and now none of these are geared specifically towards pre-K and kindergarten, so you have to put your pre-K kindergarten goggles on when you read them, but they do have some good information in them about designing classroom spaces for children. Um, the first one that I really like is Spaces and Places by Debbie Diller. Um, and this one has full color photos, which I really like. And she specifically talks about literacy in this book. So she's designing literacy spaces, classroom libraries, and things like that. Now, there's some of it that's not for pre-K, and she's, she tells you which rooms are which. So it's easy to tell. Um, but I like that one. Your, your local library might have that one. You can get that one on loan, too. Um, Environments for Learning by Eric Jensen, and Eric Jensen is very well known in the field of neuroscience and um, education, so definitely anything he puts out there is worth reading. Um, so Environments for Learning, and then there's another one. I, um, Tom has links, and he'll drop these links in the comments for you to these books. This one's called A Room to Grow, and this one had a lot of great research. So if you're looking to transform your school culture, um, if you're an administrator, if you're a teacher who's not afraid to approach your administrator with these types of resources, um, these are three books that you might want to look at for sharing with your staff to kind of get them to... Um, you know, create this mind shift where they can start to think about more intentionally how they plan their spaces. So I want to um, close this part of the broadcast with a quote from Dr. Patricia Tarr. And this quote, when I saw it, I was just like, this is the best thing I've read in a long time. So here, listen to this quote from Dr. Patricia Tarr from the University of Calgary. And this was written several years ago, and it's so relevant today that I was just like, did she see into the future? Okay, here's the quote, Dr. Patricia Tarr. Classroom environments are public statements about the educational values of the institution and the teacher. Arrangement of space, including desks, tables, materials available, and what is displayed on the walls, conveys messages about the relationship between teaching and learning. Hello! Amazing! I mean, seriously, does this lady get it or what? You don't always hear university professors who really get it, but she gets it. These things that we are putting on our walls in our classrooms convey a message about the relationship between teaching and learning. That is right. So when you have an over-decorated, over-stimulating classroom, the message, what's the message you are sending? What, what, what's that, what are people going to perceive that message as? A lot of times that message is the teacher is in control. This is the teacher's room. We are just guests in this room. And when kids feel like a guest in your classroom, they don't feel safe and they don't take educational risks. So that's a serious thing to consider. Now, the general public doesn't get that. They're going to judge based on how the classroom looks. And again, you don't want it to be a dumping ground. I mean, you want it to be organized and look attractive. That's why you're going to come to my webinar tomorrow night, Organized for Success. 
Um, and you'll notice that in my classroom, like I said, I always have the black backgrounds on my bulletin boards and the same bulletin board border. And then I have clear tubs. I can't stand those primary colored tubs or the neon ones on my shelves. I have to have clear. The kids have to see what's inside. Otherwise, they won't open it or look inside. So anyway, that quote from Dr. Patricia Tarr, if you're just joining us, you're going to want to watch this from the beginning. I'm all fired up about this topic. You're going to want to listen to that quote from Dr. Patricia Tarr. Very life-changing. So a couple of personal stories. Um, and there's my cat. She wants to be on camera tonight. She's very insistent. She's, she's going to come over my shoulder here in a minute. Um, my cousin, he is a male fourth grade teacher. And he will always be a teacher. He has a PhD. And he loves teaching. And I want you to guess how many chevron pom-poms he has hanging from the ceiling in his classroom. That's right, zero. He has no cute bulletin boards. He has no pom-poms. He has no neon colors. He has nothing. Like, he can just pack up his briefcase and go home at the end of the day, right? But this guy is one of the most amazing teachers you will ever meet. He's like the kind of teacher who they make movies about, okay? Um... And did you see that that teacher um, from Escalante, he got his own stamp too? Yeah. My cousin is a teacher like that. The connections he makes with kids is incredible. Kids, years and years from now, and he's been teaching for a long time, you know, th th they're the kind of, uh, he's the kind of teacher that they would write to after they graduated from high school or college and tell him that he was the most influential teacher they ever had. He's, he's a life-changing kind of a teacher. And he has no pom-poms in no chevron. So there's that. And then another personal story. Um, one time uh, when I was um, coaching teachers, um, I went to a school and the principal said, I want you to work with this teacher and this teacher. And I said, sure, because that was my job. Now my cat's doing something crazy. Um, and as I was working with those teachers, I noticed a teacher across the hall struggling. And I asked the principal, would you like me to work with her too? And she said, oh, no, she's a fabulous teacher. There's no need for you to bother with her. And I said, well, can I just stop in and just see how things, sure, you can go in. This teacher had um, everything you've ever seen in any Pinterest photo in her room. It was gorgeous. I had, at that point, this was several years ago, I would never seen a classroom like this. She had a clawfoot bathtub. She had neon pink boas everywhere. Um, and this was when, like, leopard and zebra were really, really in fashion in the classroom. And everything was zebra everywhere I looked. And I got dizzy just being in there. But this teacher was struggling way more than the two teachers I was working with. So I went back to the principal and I asked her if I could work with her again. And she said, no, she is a great teacher. And um, haven't you seen her classroom? Look at the clawfoot bathtub and the pink boas. <laughs> I was like, that has nothing to do with the connection that you create with kids. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it, it's not a competition. All the other teachers were trying to, you know, I don't know where to get a clawfoot bathtub. How can I find a clawfoot? bathtub. I'm like, you don't need one. It's not going to make you a better teacher. The stuff you have in your room, believe it or not, doesn't have any indication over what kind of a teacher you are. It's all about the connection that you make with kids. So I really want you to think about that tonight and any time uh, when you're watching this. My comments have frozen. I told Tom, oh, there's no need for you to be in the room tonight because my comments haven't frozen in a long time. I'll be fine. And then my comments froze up. So Tom, if you're there and there's anybody that has any pertinent questions or anything to say, come let me know because I'm just here looking at Marshall's comment that says dinosaurs from like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. But anyway, I hope that you got some information that you can take away. I would love for you to either like, heart, share, whatever this broadcast with anybody you think could use it or find it helpful. Any administrators, feel free to email it to them, whatever you want to do. I do want to remind you, and Tom will be dropping a link in the comments, I do want to remind you about my Organized for Success webinar that will happen tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. Uh, tips and tricks for organizing your classroom and getting your year off to a great start. Um, always practical ideas you can use right away. Here's Tom with any pertinent questions.
Pinterest boards, all of my boards, all 230 of them. No, um, I'm pre-K pages on Pinterest, um, but uh, Pinterest boards for classroom design or decor, is that what you think? Yep, I have one uh, there on Pinterest. It doesn't have a whole lot on it, but you want to go and check that out. Um, but most of what I talked about tonight was research, and that's really hard to pin because there's really no cute pictures to go with those. <laughs> How do word walls, ooh, you know, this is the third word wall question I've received today, and that's a good question. I am actually planning a broadcast on word walls. Um, word wall is something, and now you can call it a name wall. At the pre-K level, it's just really a name wall. Um, but um, if you're going to use your word wall as a tool for learning, to support learning, then it can be appropriately used in a pre-K classroom. If it's at eye level and it's used as a tool for learning, that's totally cool. I have had great success with a word wall slash name wall. Um, I have a um, an entire section at pre-K pages all about the word wall. If you go to pre-K pages and search word wall, you'll find that. I also have a printable uh, word wall appropriate for pre-K and kinder that's editable over at pre-K pages. So. Oh, I know, I was saying my Organized for Success broadcast is tomorrow night. And don't forget to check out the Teaching Tribe. I want to thank all the Teaching Tribe members who are here tonight that joined us uh, for this live broadcast. Um, all the Teaching Tribe uh, members have access 24-7 to all the printables at Pre-K Pages, as well as a safe haven community for asking and answering questions of your peers, and two live trainings with me every month with certificates of attendance. Also, all of these recorded broadcasts are available over in the Teaching Tribe. All right, I will see some of you at Splash this week. I will have a booth in the exhibit hall. You're going to want to stop by. I have two sessions on Friday. Um, you're going to want to stop and check one of those out. They're the same session um, because it's such a it's such a huge conference. There's no way you could see everyone you wanted to. So I really like that they're they're um, doing the two same sessions um, so that more people can have an opportunity to come to that. So I will see you all Wednesday night, and then periodically, um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I'll be jumping on and broadcasting live from Frog Street Splash Early Childhood Educational Conference in Grapevine, Texas, so you can see um, all the festivities and the fun, and you can put it on your bucket list for next year. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. Let me know in the comments below if you like this broadcast. Share it out with your friends. Have a great night.